my presentation is called Childhood Anxiety Disorders, A Look into Selective Mutism. Um, my name is Katie Campbell, and for my research, um, I had to have a mentor. So her name was Do Dr. Byron Beth Bundy, and she is a psychology professor at Eastern Kentucky University where I also go to school at. I'm currently a senior at Eastern Kentucky University and my major is Communication Disorders and Sciences. And so kind of why the reason that I'm here is because of EKU's honors program. Um, so students enrolled in the honors program must complete an undergraduate thesis on a topic of their choice. It can either be creative or a traditional thesis. I chose a traditional thesis. Um, the first semester, you have to prepare for the thesis, which involves researching and getting your IRB approval. So the second semester is actually writing your thesis and working with a faculty mentor and presenting your research findings to um, an audience of, and anyone can come. So um, it's actually a really interesting program and I'm glad I got the opportunity because now I'm here. Um, so I like to start off with a um, quote that I think is, um, really important when talking about communication. Um, so communication is not only the essence of being human, but it's also a vital property of life. Um, I find that a lot of the times we take communication for granted. Um, even as babies, you know, we cry as a reflex to get uh, food or, you know, we're uncomfortable. So I feel like it's something that we need to be reminded to be grateful um, for. Um, and so it might, um, you might be wondering why I chose the topic selective mutism. Um, so in the childhood development classes and the early intervention classes, we're taught um, that child development can be impacted in multiple areas, as such as language and speech, motor, cognitive, social, emotional. Um, if these needs are not met, then the child's development can be impacted in a series of ways. So without socialization, um, so like someone with selective mutism, if they're not speaking in certain situations and they're not socializing, their language and speech may be impacted, their motor skills may be impacted because they're not getting um, experiences through play with peers and they're not speaking. Um, cognitive can be impacted, social and emotional can definitely be impacted because they're too anxious to get out and speak. Um, so they may become frustrated, and a lot of the times um, parents can get frustrated too because they think that their child's not meeting, I guess, their behavior standards, um, when in reality a child is just really frustrated and doesn't know how to process uh, their emotions. Um, also, I had a personal interest in selective mutism because uh, I remembered as a child, I was uh, very reserved. And um, I remember a lot of the times that my parents would get frustrated because I wouldn't speak in certain situations where I was expected to speak. Uh, speak. So whether that was at a family get together or at school sometimes, like a parent-teacher conference, um, I would try to hide away and um, not speak. And they would get frustrated because, you know, they didn't understand why I was doing this. And so this led me to realizing that there's little to no research completed um, regarding selective mutism. So that's why I chose to research this topic. Um, so you may be asking, what is selective mutism? And I really like this definition I found in my research. It's, uh, this author puts it as someone who systematically refrains from speaking in some settings where speaking is expected. And most of the times this is found in uh, school settings, a teacher will report um, that a child is not speaking when called on in class, and they may think that it's a behavior issue whenever in reality um, the child is just too anxious to speak up. So the DSM-5 criteria for selective mutism starts out by saying that the child shows consistent failure to speak in specific social settings in which there is an expectation for speaking, example, at school, uh, despite speaking in other situations. So they may be chatty at home because they're comfortable at home with the parents, but whenever they get into a school setting, they may be too anxious to, anxious to speak. Um, another criteria is that 
the disturbance interferes with educational or occupational achievement or with social communication. So the educational aspect is that it can affect their academic performance, um, occupational achievement, you know, they may not be getting that their um, life experiences, going out and playing with peers and motor skills. And then with social communication, it can be slightly impacted if the child um, kind of freezes when they're spoken to or um, kind of like a blank expression on their face. Um, that can kind of lead clinicians to believe that it's a maybe a deficit, a deficit in the social communication as, uh, aspect of communication, which could also be called a pragmatic uh, deficit. So the third criteria is that the duration of the disturbance is at least one month, and it's not limited to the first month of school. Um, I kind of found that interesting because I, you know, I'm sure a lot of kids are really nervous the first month of school and it takes them a while to like warm up to the teachers. So that could be maybe the kids who never quite warm up um, after months of school, maybe um, need to get some assessments and see if this is an anxiety disorder. So um, the fourth uh, criteria is that the, fail the failure to speak is not, um, is not a lack of knowledge or comfort with the spoken language required in the social setting is more that they're just not using it and they know, but they know how to use it. Um, and the last criteria is that the disturbance is not better explained by a communication disorder, which could be a fluency disorder, an articulation disorder, um, and does not occur exclusively during the course of autism spectrum disorder or schizophrenia or another um, disorder such as DIM. Um, so a lot of people I find confuse selective mutism with autism spectrum disorder a lot um, and I'll talk more about that because it is tricky um, trying to figure out which is which um, but it is definitely autism spectrum disorder is more about the pragmatic aspect of communication while selective mutism was more about the social interaction like initiating a conversation. <laughs> And some of the symptoms are that a child can have lack of eye contact, they'll cling to their parents if they're spoken to, um, hiding, running away, crying, freezing. Um, some of them will have a tantrum if asked to speak in, you know, publicly. So like if they're asked in a class to answer a question and they didn't want to speak and the teacher got frustrated with them, um, they may you know, result in a tantrum. Um, they also have an avoidance of eating in public sometimes. They can also be anxious when having a picture or video taken and also anxious to use public restrooms. Um, as many disorders, there are um, some common misconceptions. Some, like four, uh, these four I found that are pretty I guess, evident when talking about selective mutism. So the first one is my kid is just shy. Um, a lot of the times parents think that their kid is, just has a shy uh, personality um, and that there's nothing to be worried about. There's another one that is she or he has been abused. Um, a lot of the times people think that selective mutism is only uh, present if a child has been through something that's traumatic. While that is true, that's not always the case. Um, it can also be that he had, you know, he has autism. A lot of people say, like I've already mentioned, and I'll talk about more later. Um, and then the last one, which I find really sad, and um, while they're all, you know, uh, just, you know, disturbing to say, you know, whenever a child really needs treatment, is just that she'll just grow out of it. Um, I find that sad because it's just kind of brushing off the child's symptoms and it's kind of saying that the child will never receive the treatment that he or she needs and can affect them later in life. <laughs> so some differential diagnosis or sometimes like uh, selective mutism will be diagnosed instead. Um, communication disorders, autism spectrum disorders, uh, behavioral disorders can also be part of it. So a lot of the times, again, parents will think that the child is being unruly 
or um, not behaving the way that they think they should, like if they're not speaking whenever they ask them to speak somewhere. So they may think it's a behavioral problem and some uh, parents may have a thought that their child has like oppositional defiant disorder. Um, and then another one is social anxiety disorder. And while a lot of the times that it can be comorbid with selective mutism, um, it's not as extreme as selective mutism. So we'll look closer at how selective mutism is a little um, bit different than autism spectrum disorders. Um, so here's the DSM-5 criteria for autism. Um, the first one is that they have persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction across multiple complex uh, contexts as manifested by the following. And I highlighted social communication here um, because that's one of the biggest differences between selective mutism and autism spectrum disorders. Um, selective mutism, the people who have selective mutism, like struggle more with social interaction than they do social communication. While they may, you know, freeze up there for a while, they'll eventually warm up and you'll see that they use gestures and uh, facial expressions and body language to communicate. While some with autism kind of usually has some deficits in that area. So these are the following that they have to have deficits in. Um, so the social emotional, so like the abnormal social approach and failure of normal back and forth conversations, a reduced sharing of interest, emotions or effect, and the failure to initiate or respond to social interactions. Um, and then next is that they have deficits in nonverbal communicative behaviors used for social interaction, ranging, for example, from poorly integrated verbal and nonverbal communication. And then it goes on to say to abnormal normalities in eye contact and body language, um, which is something that I said that, you know, selective, the kids with selective mutism may have issues with at first, but they'll usually warm up and start using the, that area of communication. And they also may have uh, deficits in developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships ranging from, for example, from difficulties adjusting behavior to suit various social contexts. So um, imagine if play or making friends, or they may just not want to make friends. Um, most of the time, a child with selective mutism may want to have friends. They're just too anxious to put themselves out there and start the conversation to make friends. <laughs> And then the second criteria for autism is that they have restricted repetitive behaviors. Um, and you can go on to see that they have stereotyped or repetitive motor movements, um, insistence on sameness, highly restricted. Um, and you kind of just don't see that with selective mutism. Um, it's more with autism spectrum disorders. But last, um, it also says that they may be hyper or hypo reactive to sensory input. Um, and sometimes the sensory processing disorder may cause selective mutism because maybe the child doesn't know how to respond to so much stimuli being thrown at them. But it's usually not as um, extreme as someone with autism may have because they may, you know, as it says here, excessive smelling or touching of objects, visual fascination with lots of movement. Um, with selective mutism, it's more of a overwhelming input and they don't know how to respond to the stimuli or tell someone else what they're feeling. So it can cause them just to have, you know, that anxiety disorder that makes them not want to communicate. <laughs> and then the third one is that the symptoms must be present in the early developmental period, um, which is true for uh, selective mutism kind of. Um, selective mutism can be like a disorder that happens at any stage, so it's not really has to be present in the early developmental period. Um, and then symptoms can cause clinically significant impairment in social, occupational, or other importance areas of functioning. And while that um, that's also true for selective mutism, um, but lastly it says these disturbances are not better explained by an intellectual disability. Um, so selective mutism most of the time isn't because of an intellectual disability either. Um, it's more just the child is, just has this anxiety disorder that makes them not want to speak. 
and then again like there's like kind of this up in the air type of thing that's like is selective mutism a anxiety disorder is it a communication disorder or is it both um so in my understanding that sometimes selective mutism um, can be comorbid with a communication disorder so the child may have a fluency an articulation a phonological disorder disorder or a language dis disorder so if you think about um if the child has a language disorder, they may not feel as if they can understand or express their uh, thoughts as much as their peers can. So that can cause them to be anxious and not want to speak up. Um, but I think that selective mutism is more of an anxiety disorder and not really a communication disorder. So I gave an example to try to like um, make it clear. Um, I said a child can have an articulation disorder due to a cleft palate, but the anxiety disorder permits the child from speaking because he or she is aware that he or she has a facial anomaly and that makes them not able to really speak the same as their peers. So they know that um, due to their cleft palate um, that they don't sound the same and you know they may be getting bullied. Um, they may be getting made fun of. And so that can kind of make them not want to speak anymore and anxious to speak. So they may develop selective mutism. And where there's no, like a lot of research for selective mutism, there's no like a definite cause of it. So these authors that I found uh, kind of split them up into four areas, so possible causes. And I kind of like the way that they did uh, split it up. So, First, they said, you know, that it could be genetic, that the child could have a genetic predisposition to an anxiety disorder, and that, you know, that may be the reason why they may be an anxious child and develop selective mutism. Um, next was that it may be their temperament. They may be um, a very reserved child, and that can make them more prone to selective mutism um, if they, uh, develop this need that anxiety disorder um, and then the environment which I found is uh, a big impact on probably a lot of mental health disorders um, a lot more children who uh, come from families who have uh, left the country um, left their home country and are learning the English language, or we call them English language learners, sometimes um, will have a silent period whenever they're learning the language, and they won't feel as if they are, I guess, uh, fluent enough to speak to other peers in their new um, environment, um, and they just may be nervous to, you know, they may mess up on the language and can just cause them to, maybe develop selective mutism. And then two, um, a lot of children who come from immigrant families are much more likely to develop selective mutism because it um, can sometimes be scary to come into a new environment and um, not to expect like, not to expect what's going to happen next. Um, and then also too, just an environment that is healthy and the family wants to, you know, push the children, like help them, um, can really help out kids with selective mutism. And then on the other hand, if there's, you know, there's a likelihood that a child with selective mut like may develop selective mutism if the family's going through a divorce or a hard time. Um, I just think that environment has a lot to do with selective mutism. Um, and then last was the neurodevelopmental issues. So I mentioned cleft palate, which may be um, something that happens in utero and the child, you know, has the cleft palate and knows that they're different than their peers and can cause some um, problems in school and can cause them to not speak. Um, and also too, like if a child has a language disorder, like I said before, that receptive and expressive language issues may cause them to be reluctant to speak and get, just get frustrated and kind of just shut down um, and not speak at all. 
So I was interested in my research at who can really treat this disorder. Um, and so I split, I thought the two clinicians that I thought would have a lot to do with this disorder was a speech language pathologist or a clinical psychologist. Um, I was personally interested in um, speech language pathology because that's the road that I'm going down um, for a future career. And then my mentor, um, being the psychology professor she was, she was interested to see um, if clinical psychologists are the main like, person to treat this disorder too. So I kind of just laid out the roles of the SLP and the clinical psychologist. So the clinical psychologist is more about diagnosing or evaluating mental and emotional disorders. Um, of individuals and administering uh, programs of treatment, interviews, patients in clinics, hospitals, and other st uh, settings and studies, uh, medical and social case histories. While the communication disorder sciences person or speech language pathologist is going to be working more to prevent and diagnose and treat speech, language, social communication, cognitive communication, and swallowing disorders in children and adults. Children and adults. So, the social communication aspect is more of a speech language pathologist job um, in that pragmatic field. But a lot of the times, um, like I said before, uh, children with selective mutism don't really have issues with the pragmatic area of communication. Um, it, at first they may seem to, but they definitely, um, a lot of the times will just warm up and um, through therapy begin to show that they do have facial expressions, gestures, uh, joint attention, eye contact. Um, so, so potential therapy techniques, while again, um, there is not a lot of research on selective mutism, um, I found that these were the most, like, I saw these the most through my research coming up from journal articles and studies. So um, the applied behavior analysis could be used for selective mutism. And I thought that the AB model can be used to show that the, what happens before their behavior. So the child can be, um, it can be brought to their attention that um, they get asked a question in class. And because of that, their behavior is not speaking. Um, so that could be a start of therapy, you know, bringing it up to their attention that this is where they get nervous or this is where what causes them not to speak. Another one is stimulus fading. So an example of that is a child is with a parent and slowly the parent lets the new conversation partner, which would be the therapist, join until the child does not rely on the parent to be present in new social settings, which would most likely be the therapy room. Um, another one would be shaping. So providing praise or positive reinforcement whenever the child points to something, then whispers until they speak comfortably, comfortably in their new setting. So, um, you know, the child may come into the therapy room and they're only pointing and gesturing to things, but hopefully um, we'll get them to where they're whispering and then slowly like talking to us. And then again, we can use cognitive behavioral therapy like with other anxiety disorders and also Pharmaceutics can be used, um, anxiety medications, if that's what's best fit for the child. So I added a um, clinical scenario um, to kind of describe what it may look like if a child came in um, with selective mutism and the uh, um, parents not quite know what's wrong. Um, so a parent or guardian comes into a pediatric speech language therapy clinic worried because their child's teacher called her stating that her child would not speak in class when asked a question. The teacher also states that the child freezes, then begins to cry when asked to answer a question in class. The parent or guardian reports to the speech language pathologist that her child is chatty at home and has hardly any behavioral issues. The parents also state states that her child did not have any issues at birth or does not have any health issues uh, up, yeah, present. So the speech language pathologist administer, administers the Goldman Fristo to find that the child is in normal range for errors at his age. So you can see that the teacher was the first person to realize or notice that their, the child has had um, issues speaking up in class when 
asked a question and the parent kind of doesn't understand because the kid seems chatty at home, which sometimes happens with selective mutism. And coming in in a speech therapy uh, clinic, the speech therapist wants to make sure that it's nothing to do with their speech or language abilities. And after, you know, the child scores okay on the Goldman Fristo, the speech language pathologist may recommend them to a clinical psychologist to see if this is more of an anxiety disorder. So, um, as I said before, with uh, Eastern Kentucky University's honors program, I had the opportunity to complete an undergraduate thesis. Um, in a topic of my choice. And so I have some research findings after doing that. And my mentor and I kind of sat down and we were trying to uh, make this unique. And so we were kind of doing this like SLPs versus clinical psychologists. And we wanted to know if there is a difference in the confidence level between communication disorders graduate students at EKU and clinical psychology graduate students at EKU concerning their knowledge and treatment of selective mutism. And we picked graduate students specifically because we wanted to see if our programs were, te were teaching selective mutism and if it's something that needs to be taught more in pre-service um, programs. So our thesis or hypothesis was that both uh, future SLPs and clinical psychologists have little to no experience treating selective mutism because it was so like a, such an under-researched topic. And our purpose in doing this was that we found that children with selective mutism are very few in number. Um, and we thought that may could be because, you know, it's not something that a lot of people know about. So these kids may be getting diagnosed with social anxiety disorder or another disorder that isn't quite um, selective mutism. And also too, like uh, in general, the population, one in 200 children are inflicted with selective mutism. And that again, there are so many misconceptions that prevent them from never getting the treatment that they need. And that can affect them later in life, whether that's finishing school, going to college and maintaining a job or just a happy life. Um, and again, selective mutism can affect school performance and possibly affect development in those uh, um, areas of development that I talked about, speech, language, motor, social, emotional, and that social skills are important for school-age children to adults. So if children are not getting out, socializing, making friends, then that can cause them to have, you know, a lot of issues later in life. <laughs> Um, so to start out, we kind of um, build a little survey to give to the graduate students. And what's kind of neat about this is that we found a thesis from a past uh, individual who at Eastern Kentucky University who surveyed speech language pathologist only in the schools. Um, and so we wanted to take her survey and kind of make it unique in saying that, um, giving it to the graduate students to see if our programs are teaching it. Rather, she already um, gave it to school-based speech pathologists who have already graduated. So we had six questions that were Likert scale questions. They're rated one to five. Um, and uh, they said that information about selective mutism should be taught more often and in greater depth in college slash university SLP training program or clinical psychology training program. And the second one was I feel that treatment and selective mutism, I feel that treatment selective mutism is within my personal scope of expertise. Uh, and then third, I have located adequate adequate resources for referring a child with selective mutism to professionals within my community. And then we also had five multiple choice questions and I've listed some of them here. Um, they said, have you ever provided services to a child with selective mutism? And then which of the following best describes the population of your work location? And then third, have you ever attended a course or workshop focused specifically on selective mutism? And our methods of doing so was that we surveyed both graduate cohorts, clinical psychology and communication disorders and sciences from EKU using SurveyMonkey under IRB approval. 
We compared the averages to see if there are differences between the groups when providing therapy to children with selective mutism. And then uh, we computed statistical t-test and chi-square um, test to see if one graduate cohort is more confident or has more experience in treating selective mutism. So here are our um, results. Um, so the question was, have you ever provided services to children with selective mutism? Um, and something weird about this question was that there are 28 respondents to this question, and then the rest of the questions, there are only 27 respondents. So someone must have took this survey and only answered number one. Um, but it shows that only one person uh, said yes, they had, and then 27 people said no, they have never provided services to children with selective mutism. Then second was, have you ever attended a course or workshop focused specifically on selective mutism? Um, five had said yes, and 22 had said no. And then the third question was, approximately how many children with selective mutism characteristics, past or present, have you encountered in your professional practice? Um, so 20 said zero, and seven said uh, one to three. And then we also asked a question kind of about demographics, uh, which of the following describes the population of your work location? And you can see that a lot of them were in a small town or a large town. There weren't, there really wasn't any um, large cities or um, it was mostly small towns. So that could also have an impact on our research because they may just have less, um, less uh, children that they're providing therapy to given that they're in a smaller town. So on the clinical psychology side, there were 22 respondents to this um, survey. And so uh, four had said yes, they have provided services to children with selective mutism, and 18 said that they had not. Um, the second question was, have you ever attended a course or workshop focused specifically on selective mutism? One said yes, and then 21 said no. <clears throat> and then this one was kind of interesting. Um, we asked approximately how many children with selected mutism characteristics, past or present, have you encountered in your professional practice? 14 had zero, um, seven had one to three, and then there was one person who said they had four to six um, children with selected mutism that they've encountered. Um, so the demographics, uh, they were kind of different than the communication disorders uh, demographics area. So we asked which of the following describes the population of your work location. And this is kind of a little bit more spread out. Um, they, a lot of them lived in a large town or a large central city. So they may be getting more children in their clinics than they may just see selective mutism more. And um, so our results were that Participants were, um, were asked how many clients with selective mutism they had treated or encountered, and psych psych psychology students had encountered on average one uh, client with selective mutism, and then speech language students, uh, they slightly less than one on average. And then there's no significant differences between numbers of clients treated. You can see our results from our t-test there. We also found that there's no association um, between graduate student groups, so the communication disorders versus psychology, and history of direct experience or training events on selective mutism. And you can see the results of our chi-square test there. And then results continued. Um, an independent samples t-test was conducted to compare responses to the six Likert scale questions between the psychology and communication disorders graduate student groups. There were no significant differences in the scores between the two graduate students groups, suggesting that there were equal ratings across the groups on questions measuring concepts such as confidence in treating selective mutism and feeling that there, um, that there are enough journal and articles uh, available about selective, selective mutism. And also, too, we found interesting was that the highest ranked item for both groups of students was the following. Um, information about selective mutism should be taught more in college and university pre-service training programs. 
and the means for this was psychology was 4.6 and then CDS was 4.7. Um, so one being that they're less light, um, needed to be taught less, and then five being that they needed to be taught more. And our conclusions that we found too about um, all of this research was that, of course, selective mutism needs to be taught more in programs for pre-service individuals. Um, and that there needs to be more workshops or specific instruction for selective mutism. Um, and it needs to be just offered more. Um, and that many pre-service individuals have little to no experience with selective mutism. Um, I found it, of course, interesting surveying students from Eastern Kentucky University to see if our programs um, taught about selective mutism more. And it was interesting to see the different responses. Um, and I hope that this research can, you know, be used to advocate that we need to provide more workshops, specific instruction um, for these kids. But we did have some limitations um, to our research, and that was because each graduate cohort has a small sample size. Um, the CDS respondees, uh, respondents were 27, and then the clinical psychology was only 22. And we also didn't take age into consideration, so, you know, um, if someone was maybe older, they could have more experience with children, they may have more selective, uh, work with selective mutism more often. And um, something else we talked about, me and my mentor, was that graduate students are new at treating most types of disorders. So in communication disorders, um, one of the most common is an articulation disorder. So they start us out treating articulation disorders before they start us out with more complex disorders. And for clinical psychology too, um, we felt that students or pre-service students are more than likely to treat like the generalized anxiety disorder um, rather than something extreme like selective mutism. So it may just be something that they hadn't got to yet. And in our discussion, we, uh, saw that both psychology and speech language students or communication disorder students reported relatively little direct experience with individuals with selective mutism. And while we didn't find any significant differences in reported comfort in treating, knowledge about, available information about, and locating resources for selective mutism, it is notable that the question endorsed most strongly by both groups of graduate students relates to the need for more training about this specialized disorder. And then, you know, our goals for my thesis was that I wanted to raise awareness. Um, it is such an under-researched under uh, disorder, and to me, it just breaks my heart thinking that there are children out there who um, think that they're just shy or that they'll just grow out of it and they never get the treatment that they need. Um, and so I wanted to take the blame off the child, too. And this is not me saying that it's the parent's fault or the family's fault or anything. It's just that we need to provide more information to um, educate parents and families about this disorder. Because I can't imagine um, being so like so anxious that I couldn't speak at all. And most of the time, you know, the parents may get frustrated because they don't understand why their child may be so anxious to speak. So I wanted to take the blame off the child and realize that this isn't actually a um, specialized anxiety disorder in that they need um, help, they need treatment for this. And so I just really wanted to give advice for the parents and the families to show them that, you know, there is help out there. And then again, I wanted to encourage cross-disciplinary practice because um, a speech language pathologist, you know, may be able to help and a clinical psychologist may be able to help too, but if they work together, then, you know, it may be more beneficial for the child, rather the child just seeing one professional versus the other. Um, and every time that, you know, we work together, um, I just feel like it's so much more beneficial for the client. And then, like, after, you know, a lot of people think that this may just affect children, but really there's effects throughout the lifespan. So if selective mutism isn't treated, um, there may be worsening anxiety, uh, depression and other anxieties may occur, social isolation and withdrawal, um, 
can be very harmful to someone who's um, going into adulthood, you know, making decisions, getting jobs. Um, poor self-esteem and self-confidence can also affect that. Um, another one is school refusal, uh, poor academic performance, and the possibility of even quitting school. So the not getting treated for uh, selective mutism may and make it worse and just continuously like a snowball effect really and that the child may just or the person may just kind of give up um and then underachievement academically and in the workplace like i said um they may not be able to make uh peers uh or relationships in the workplace to make them you know have a good work experience which could contribute to just a happy life um and then also yeah, i think uh you know, we see with a lot with anxiety disorders and depression that they may start to self-medicate and with drugs and or alcohol and um it may contribute to su suicidal thoughts and possible suicide if their anxiety um disorder is not treated um so yeah i really think that given that awareness to selective mutism that it deserves can really like um maybe not cause these um hopefully we can avoid that and treat them when they're uh, children and those are my references